Good morning, everyone. So it's an honor for me to, to be here. Of course, I'd like to thank Chelsea as well and others who organized these series of, of panels on uh, 1968. I truly feel honored to participate, to think about, to remember, to project 1968 specifically as we're marching into 2018. To my fellow panelists, to all of you coming and listening this early morning, I of course thank you. Uh, we, so we're talking in this panel about 1968 as a local and global event. How do we as historians negotiate 1968 as a global and local event, particularly on its 50 year anniversary, you know, in this time, in this place, and we all know what's happening in this time and in this place. I think the best way to negotiate 1968 from the prevailing global perspective of the American mind, and I should say, you know, a lot of my work deals with intellectual history. Uh, so I think the best way to negotiate 1968 from the prevailing global perspective of the American mind which is to say the prevailing global perspective of the white American mind, which is to say the prevailing global perspective of the racist American mind, is to recollect a blockbuster film that was released early in 1968. Seems like we're all talking a little bit about films. Right? Yeah. Uh, it is a film historians, I think, rarely discuss as we negotiate 1968 as both a global and a local event on the human mind, or in my case, the global American mind. My brief talk is entitled, Planet of the Whites. On January 17, 1968, President Lyndon B Baines Johnson submitted his State of the Union to Congress. He spoke to a raging Congress, representing a raging America. Many Americans were not, were not raging at the racial inequities voiced in the soon-to-be-released conclusions of the Kerner Commission. Many Americans were not raging against what the Kerner Commission report considered a hopelessly racist mainstream media. The press has too long basked in a white world, looking out at it, if at all, with white men's eyes and white perspective. Many Americans were not raging against, as the Kerner Commission put it, our nation moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. President Johnson did not speak to a crowd raging against the progression of racism since civil rights legislation. Many Americans were raging, many of these politicians, I should say, were raging like their constituents against years of civil rights and black power protests decades of decolonization movements from Latin America to Asia to Africa. They were raging against all the disruptive protests against cultural conformity, against the Vietnam War, against all forms of inequality locally and globally. If they had, to a certain extent, been complaining for years, for decades, then I would argue 1968 was the year of the reactionary outburst validated by President Johnson and especially presidential candidate Richard Milhouse Nixon. President Johnson's civil rights statements during this speech aroused scattered applause. But when he thundered that, quote, the American people have had enough of rising crime and lawlessness, the applause was deafening. In applause, he carried on as he listed a series of anti-crime measures. After three straight decades of violent decolonization movements across the world, after three straight summers of urban rebellions in the United States, some of those applauding the speech, both in the Capitol and around the country, actually feared a violent anti-white rebellion could be rushing from around the corner or even had arrived. And their local and global fears were reflected in a new blockbuster film that broke box, box office records weeks after Johnson's address. Quote, I wish King Kong hadn't been made so I could make it, film producer Arthur P. Jacobs once said. To recap, 
The movie King Kong shares the adventure tale of a colossal island-dwelling ape who dies attempting to possess a young and beautiful white woman. From the beginning of racist ideas, when European explorers were simultaneously discovering the African and the humanoid animal known as the ape in West Africa, when Enlightenment philosophers were likening the human to the ape, when producers of racist ideas were constructing the African as the most inferior human and the ape as the most superior animal, the African has been compared to the ape. The 1933 film King Kong was nothing but a remake of The Birth of a Nation, veiling the physically powerful black man by casting him as the physically powerful ape. In both films, the Negro ape terrorizes white people, tries to destroy white civilization, and pursues a white woman before a dramatic climax, the lynching of the Negro ape. King Kong was stunningly original and ahead of its time for showing images of racist ideas, of racist violence, without ever saying a word about black people and white people or even race. Instead of remaking The Birth of the Nation yet again, film producer Arthur P. Jacobs found his King Kong in Frenchman Pierre Boulez's 1963 novel, La Palette des Singes, please. Excuse my French. <laughs> he, he made, eventually, the planet of the apes. Jacob's film changed much of the plot and dialogue, but retained the basic story of the novel. Taylor, a white male astronaut and his crew, are returning to Earth after being away for more than 2,000 years. Their ship crashes on a planet that doesn't look like Earth. They begin exploring and come upon ragged, mute white slaves before being rounded up and beaten by whip-swinging, gun-wielding humanoid apes. Taylor spends most of the film begging for his freedom. He finally escapes, and in one of the iconic scenes in Hollywood history, comes upon a rusted and abandoned Statue of Liberty. He realized it in an instant. Earth has been taken over by civilized apes who are enslaving the primitive humans. The planet of the whites is no more. Planet of the Apes seemed to take the place of Tarzan and King Kong in racist popular culture, inspiring four sequels between 1970 and 1973, comic books, video games, television series, merchandise, you name it, the franchise produced it. While Tarzan and King Kong screened the racist confidence of the conquering dark world in the first half of the 20th century, Planet of the Apes screened the racist panic of the conquered dark world fighting for power and its own statues of liberty in the second half of the 20th century. In the racist mind, resisting African Americans and the non-white world resisting Western imperialism worldwide were not merely fighting for power and freedom, they were fighting to rule and enslave the white world. The American fear, the Western fear, was essentially local and global. In 1968, black power for racist America meant black supremacy and white slavery. Just as 50 years later, Black Lives Matter for racist America means black supremacy and white lives do not matter. The criminal apes of black power, of Black Lives Matter, to these people are running wild. By 1968, both Democrats and Republicans had popularized the call for law and order. And Nixon, of course, made it a central plank of his campaign, just as Donald Trump did 50 years late, nearly 50 years later. Law and order became a motto for defending the planet of the whites. In 1968, a Gallup poll found 81% of its respondents believed law and order has broken down in this country. Law and order rhetoric was thereby used to defend police brutality and racist brutality 
And both the rhetoric and the brutality triggered urban rebellions that in turn triggered more rhetoric and brutality. Fear of the planet of the apes came to dominate, I argue, the racist American consciousness in 1968. Fears that would go on to be personified in criminals, in protesters, in welfare recipients, in communists, in affirmative action uh, recipients, in immigrants, and I think everybody gets the point. These fears came, of course, to dominate political campaigns over the next five decades. The fear of the planet of the apes was then actualized in 2008 when a man whose face was superimposed as an ape became president of the United States, the most powerful position in the world. At the same time, a new round of Planet of the Ape films became popular. And so therefore, it would make sense that his successor would pledge to make the planet great again. And I just want to sort of say that we, of course, are living in many ways thereby, in the culmination of the history of fear that was given voice in 1968, a fear that was fundamentally global and local. Thank you.